gemstone traceability, and specifically for today, colored gemstone traceability. Now it's something that both unites and divides the gemstone trade. It unites, since everyone really seems to agree that being able to give a definitive origin for a gemstone, and then to be able to track its journey to the consumer is a positive message, especially a positive message that the consumer wants to hear. Yet it divides some people because some disagree on how to achieve it, whether it is possible, and if it might actually damage the livelihoods of some stakeholders in the gemstone supply chain. So today I am very pleased to say we've gathered four experts in their fields. We have a gemstone trader, a marketeer, a scientist, and a rural development and artisanal and small scale mining specialist to discuss the topic and try to answer that question. Is it a viable objective or an unrealistic challenge? Before I introduce all of our speakers today, let's check in with Steve. Steve, how are you this morning? Welcome. Hi, Ed. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm well. Uh, I'm speaking from Tel Aviv. The weather is good. Uh, I understand that it's raining in some other places. Um, just a few uh, um, uh, technical uh, um, issues. Uh, just one, actually, an internal issue to the panelists over here. Um, uh, Daniel, I've been trying to start your video unsuccessfully. It's not letting me do it. Can you start it from your side? Oh, so um, you, you want me to get out and log in again? Um, I'm not sure. I just keep on getting a, uh, a your video has got a red line through it. I, I'm not able to do it from where I'm sitting. Uh, it tells me that the host has deactivated it, but maybe that's... Okay, no problem. I'll make you a co-host again. Danny, you should be able to do it now. Okay. Ah. I think it's... Yeah. Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, what, uh, just a few housekeeping um, uh, things over here for those who, who have, are joining us for the first time. Uh, we, we, we will uh, take questions from, uh, from the audience, so that, there, that at the moment is approaching 180. Um, the, uh, but what we do request is that you put the questions into the Q&A box, which you can get if you look at the top of your screen. Uh, and what we will do is that we will get to as many questions as possible. Uh, and uh, those will be answered by the panelists. The panelists will have the opportunity to, uh, to answer you directly by um, sort of in writing as well. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is quickly go over to Gaetana, who will just offer a few words of welcome, and uh, then we'll get the show on the road. Gaetana? Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much to all the panelists who have accepted to be with us today. Let me also thank uh, the uh, increasing number that up to now is 187 going up, nine, and so on. So I believe that uh, what we are doing uh, uh, during this uh, uh, several session of uh, webinars we are trying to keep everyone informed, uh, uh, bringing different uh, voices and different point of view from all around the world. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we all enjoy this uh, incredible panel. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Great. Thank you, Gaetano. Thank you for being with us as always. And thank you for your support for these webinars. It's much appreciated <laughs> by all of the trade. Thank you very much. So let's get to our panelists today. Clement Sabah, let's start with Clement. Clement is the president of the ICA, the International Colored Gemstone Association, and also owner of Ben Sabah Brothers. He's a second generation gemstone miner, cutter, and wholesaler. Clement's father and uncle began the family business in 1961 in Minas Gerais in Brazil. Clement, good morning to you. How are you today? 
Good morning from Brazil. Hello all. I would like to first here to thank Sibjo in the name of Gaetano for this wonderful job with these webinars. Very informative. Would like to greet the panelists, Christina, Daniel, Helle, and uh, Edward and, uh, and uh, Steve. It's good to be here and I hope we'll have a very good uh, talk this morning. I mean, this morning here. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot Christina, Clement. You forgot Christina. Christina. I mentioned Christina, no? Sorry if I did. You know? No, it's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Clement. It's so nice for you to join. You're in Brazil, right? In Minas Gerais today? Right. In Governador Valadares, Minas Gerais. Nice to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank Haley you. Henning. Haley is the Chief Commercial Officer for Greenland ruby which is a ruby and pink sa sapphire mining operation in apulitok i hope i pronounce it right it means translates as red in greenlandic and it's in southwest southwest greenland so haley has been based in new york since 2001 and many of us know her for her over 20 years of marketing and csr corporate social responsibility experience in the gemstone and jewelry industry good morning to you there in New York, Haley. Yes, good morning. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Edward, for that uh, very, very nice introduction. Uh, good morning, Gaetano. Good morning, Steve, and my co panelists, Christina, Daniel. And um, uh, I'm forgetting. Um, and, and of course, Kim, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> going on all over the street, people saying hi from all over the world. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm absolutely honored to be amongst this very esteemed panel and I'm excited to see people joining us from all over the world, which is testament to this really very, very relevant topic and I'm looking forward to the hour together. So thank you very much for, for having me here today. You're welcome. It is disconcerting, isn't it? When we look down at the chat and we see all of our friends posting messages and they're coming in from, from Hawaii to New Zealand, you know, it's, 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 it's empowering really, isn't it? Yeah, it's really fun. So next to Christina. Christina Viegas is the director for the Mind to Market program of PACT. Steve, if you could move the slides on, please. Um, PACT is an NGO which is active in 40 countries around the world. Now, Christina recently led the team that created Moyo Gems, which is a first of its kind responsible mind to market sourcing program which is working with female artisanal gemstone miners in Tanzania. Christina, good morning to you, welcome. Good morning, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure, thank you. What does Moyo gems mean? Uh, Moyo means um, heart or spirit in Swahili and also um, in a few other languages around the African continent, uh, including Shona, where I'm from Zimbabwe, where I spend a lot of time. Um, and so uh, it was born in Tanzania, but um, Moyo really resonates um, across the continent and hopefully after this call around the world. That's a great name. And we'll look forward to hearing more about that project later on this morning. So thank you. Welcome to you. And last but definitely not least, Daniel Niefler, who's the managing director of Gubelin Gem Lab. Danny really is a, gem a, a, excuse me, a geologist by training. Um, and he completed his PhD in mineralogy in Switzerland. Previously a strategy consultant, he joined the Google in Gem Lab in 2003. So good afternoon and welcome to you, Daniel. Thank you, Edward. And um, thank you um, everyone from SIP Show to have me on this, um, on this panel. It's a great honor and pleasure. Um, also special thanks to the people in Zipsha working in the background. I think of Stephen. I also think of you, um, Edward, not so much in the background, but you having to organize the photos up of us is already quite a job and you have to do that once per week. So I don't envy you for that job. <laughs> um, I'm doing good. I'm in Switzerland. You know, we are, we went through an interesting couple of months as probably everybody did, you know, and nobody um, has probably gone through something like that. So it's new. It's kind of, um, interesting, challenging, sometimes even exciting. Um, so we took the opportunity to rethink what we do, you know, to discuss what we do, not only to assume uh, what our clients might want to know, but also get in touch with clients because now it's a different situation. 
and now they get out of hibernation and it's a good opportunity for us to kind of contact them and ask them what they actually want. So for us, it's kind of a very interesting time, not, not in a negative way only, but also in a positive way. So, and of course, I'm looking forward to this panel. Thank you, Edward, for running the show. You're welcome. And it's nice to have you with us. So quickly, before we get started, please note that none of the opinions or information that's offered during this webinar constitutes any legal, financial, or official advice. Uh, SIPJO provides a global perspective on the challenges that we're facing. So please, for more precise information, we do encourage you to play an active part in your local trade associations and seek advice relevant to your location and your business. So responsible sourcing and traceability. We think we're talking about traceability today, but also there's this term responsible sourcing. So Danny, maybe I could turn to you first as the scientist and somebody who's been developing um, traceability systems and is very much involved in responsible sourcing uh, globally for the colored gemstone business. Is it possible to source responsibly without having a fully traceable supply chain? Well, I believe it is. You know, it's not as such that a responsible sourcing is something new that, uh, that is on the agenda only since a couple of years. I'm sure that uh, uh, Clement will agree with me that responsible sourcing is done since uh, decades and centuries. Um, the change that we see or believe to see is that uh, now more and more um, the end consumers and also the brands, uh, they want to have some kind of, um, of evidence, you know, some kind of independent um, uh, proof that indeed uh, it's done in a, in a certain way. And that's also why we came up then with um, our initiative, you know, to kind of provide a, a prerequisite for, for, um, for um, proof, to prove this um, sustainability or responsibility, which is transparency. Okay, thank you. Well, let's see if Clement does agree with you. Clement, what, what do you think about that? Is it possible to source responsibly without having a fully traceable supply chain? Oh, yes, I think it's possible to source responsibly as long as we understand the particularities of the business and we don't try to physically trace every single stone. Uh, ICA believes in a practical and reasonable approach to traceability. We can only ask participants to make their best efforts to conduct due diligence and in the knowledge that traceability is very limited for a vast majority of the volumes, sources, varieties, and gemstones. That's uh, what we think. Okay, so you think limited. So, I mean, let's turn to somebody who's been doing it. Haley, um, from Greenland Ruby's perspective. You're, um, you're on your journey to certification with RJC at the moment, Responsible Jewelry Council. So what, what do you think about the balance between sourcing responsibly or full traceability supply chains? Yeah, thank you, Ed, and thanks for the question uh, being posed in my direction. And, you know, of course, this is a very controversial um, topic. And uh, as, as uh, Clement said, it's, you know, something that, that's been discussed for a number of years amongst the colored gemstone industry. At Greenland Ruby, we're in the very fortunate position that we can track and trace each and every gem directly back to the mine. And there's a number of reasons why we are able to do that and ways in which we actually harness um, all of that information, um, which, which we're doing very, very successfully. And of course, so that is an easy question for me to answer from my perspective, but it is undoubtedly difficult to do with other colored gemstones um, that, that don't have, um, you know, a very obvious and transparent supply chain. Um, but my answer to this question is let's um, take the mystery out of the supply chain, but keep the mystique, because that's a little bit what's, uh, what, what the colored gemstone industry is all about. Yeah, thank you. Christina, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed your hand. You, you, you wanted to join, and actually it's relevant for your voice in this question as well, because you've been running that project already with Moyo Gems. How long have, has it, have you had that traceable supply chain with Moyo? Uh, we've been active for one year um, and working on the project for two years. Okay. Um, you know, I think a, a couple of years ago, before we, we started Moyo, um, I think people would be right to answer the question, no, you don't need traceability because it's very difficult. 
Um, but I think now with, with Moyo, uh, which works with artisanal gem miners, um, about eight hours from the capital city on pretty bad roads uh, with very limited internet, um, we can actually tell you who mined your gem and we can tell you all about her. Um, so, um, and by the way, we're using blockchain. Um, we're using Danny's technology to do that. Um, and so far more than 2000 gemstones have been traced um, on the blockchain. Um, so it is indeed possible, um, we're showing it, but other folks are showing it as well. Um, you have some really interesting initiatives um, from Swarovski, from De Beers, um, and from um, others um, around the world. And um, uh, you know, if, if you don't know where your gemstone comes from, how can you possibly work on the conditions um, at the source? Um, how can you possibly respond to a conscious consumer who wants to know that information? Um, so at the very least, um, you should know the country of origin, um, and that is indeed possible by working with your current suppliers, and I can tell you um, a bit later on how to encourage them and incorporate them into your supply chain. Um, but even beyond the country, specifically where it's from and what are the issues there, um, and that's what traceability starts to get at. It's a first step in your responsibility journey. And if you don't know where your stuff is coming from, you cannot call your materials responsible. We've got a really interesting comment here in the chat from Jean-Claude Michelou. Hi, Jean-Claude, thank you so much for joining us and your voice is very relevant in this discussion. But he points out, of course, that Greenland is, is you know, a, a one stone species from one big single deposit from one single operator. So it's, it's quite a refined uh, supply chain there. But, Christine, if I stay with you for, for what you're doing in, in, in Tanzania, um, multiple different stones, multiple different miners, not one location, yet you're making it work. But people talk about the fact that if we want to build that out and have more traceability, it, it, is it more of an aspirational goal or do you think it is a reasonable objective to have wider full traceability? Uh, you need partners. Um, that's a short answer. Um, you know, Moyo was created for a specific context um, for uh, folks who are out in the very rural areas. We do work with sapphires, rubies, um, tourmalines, the umba garnets, um, and these are all some of the most beautiful stones in the world. They're untreated, uh, they're natural, they're bright and clear. Um, and, um, you know, so we, we created the, the Moyo program with the advice and direction of, of the women miners themselves. And that was um, really important to us as social justice um, advocates, but it's not appropriate everywhere. Um, so, you know, we've been um, asked by um, a few groups in Southern Africa to help them understand how to um, take advantage of, the op of, of what's around them, of the structures they have, and be creative in their sourcing. And um, it might not be the specific miner, or it might be that, um, but we have to see. So um, in order to, um, you know, respond to a new atmosphere that the consumer is demanding, um, and especially in this time of, um, you know, uh, social change around the world, you know, Black Lives Matter and racial, ju racial justice. Um, I think it's a new day and there's new expectations. And so I think we, we must respond, but to have new people in the room. And I think that's been the difference in the last two years is getting different people in the room and figuring it out um, hand in hand. Yeah, thank you. Different people in the room, of course, you know, the biggest group really, um, the ICA and all the members around the world that, that, that range from mining through to retailing colored gemstones. Clement, from your position as, as a trader and as a miner and a cutter, is full traceability an aspirational goal or do you think it's something that we should be really striving for? Yeah, we support and comprehend the importance of transparency to the end consumer. And uh, still we don't, we, un, we have to understand the particularities of the gemstone business, which make full traceability more of an aspirational goal than a feasible one. We consider full traceability to be unreasonable for many reasons, such as a large number of species, hundreds of varieties of colors, small scale deposits in more than 50 producing countries, extracted by thousands of miners at, the, at remote locations and following different paths, a huge number of different paths. 
and the ASM deposits have a very limited and potential and limiting investment and with no long-term visibility. Stones can be resorted, regraded, recut throughout the process. Those are only some reasons why traceability is generally unmanageable and a reality to only a few specific stones and companies that uh, Haley will be uh, giving some examples here and Daniel also uh, with the emeralds. So, Daniel, uh, sorry. Oh, so ICA believes very strongly that the industry should not allow powerful companies with vested interest to set the standards for the industry. Many of these standards are totally unworkable, totally unworkable for millions of gemstone workers like mining, cutting, handling gemstones. Large producers with very short supply chain have a lot to gain promoting their ethical methods, we understand. However, promoting standards and systems that are unrealistic and unworkable for the vast majority of the industry players it's a misuse of market power. This itself could be deemed unethical, in our opinion. Danny, we you wanted to respond to that, and then Christina wanted to come in as well. Danny yeah. first. Give yeah. me just one more minute. Oh, sorry, Simon. Sorry. Yeah. We must highlight that ICA represents the cornerstone industry worldwide. And with more than 700 of the prominent members <clears throat> from all the supply chain, we have been working closely in this particular subject and we have always been available to sit and work together with stakeholders to find the best solutions for our industry. Thank you. Thank you. Danny. Um, Clement, you know, I mean, your, your concern is very valid, but I mean, that's the beauty of technology that it allows today to, um, even for very low quality goods, to make them um, traceable. We have a small project in uh, near Sakaraha in, um, in Madagascar. It's called Rome. It's a women lapidary uh, cooperative and they are using uh, or they are putting all their stones and you know what kind of stones these are? These are cut-offs from bigger players of and of amethyst and such kind of stones. So cut-offs, the low quality or the waste of low or uh, say of um, what was called in the past semi-precious gemstones and they are putting all these stones, either as batches or as individual stones, mostly batches, what I understand, they are putting on the blockchain. All we had to do is to, um, we were funding one computer to this cooperative and we were giving, there was uh, one per part we worked with who was, who was telling these uh, ladies how to enter uh, their batches, their parcels of stones into the blockchain, how to split them when they got sold later on and how to watch them for zero additional cost for them. They have no running cost whatsoever and they can use it for really low, low value gemstones. So technical solutions are there today. Yeah, thank you. And Clement, there's a lot of uh, agreement with what uh, Clement has said there, but I just want to turn to Christina because you had a point to make as well. Yeah, sure, um, you know, the, the, the field is changing and I think it's important to recognize um, you know, who has been changing it and how long they've been working to do so. Um, so you have, um, you know, you have new initiatives like Moyo, um, like Gemfair, um, and um, increasingly others that are coming online that um, Danny has pointed out, um, you know, and we work across, um, I think the big four now, uh, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and diamonds. Um, and um, soon um, I'll be working with emerald miners um, <laughs> to get them on the blockchain too. Uh, for, from, from ASM sources. So um, I think, you know, we have shown that it can work for both the big, you know, important stones, um, but also the lower value ones like amethyst and citrines and those. Um, so uh, again, I think it's just important to recognize things have changed. But we also, you can also take a look at who's been working on this for a very long time. Um, working alone, um, but making a change and establishing traceability um, without fancy technology. Um, so if you look at Columbia Gem House, for example, you know, Eric Von Wert is, um, you know, a real pioneer. And um, I've been getting to know how he's been doing his traceability. And um, it's just separating out parcels, getting to know the miners, um, as asking them what they want to work on, and um, supporting them over time. So it is not responsible to walk away from a difficult place. 
it is responsible to engage. Um, you know, in, in Tanzania, um, we walked into a situation where a lot of the miners were working on someone else's concession. Um, and they had a verbal agreement, um, but not a written one. So um, we started working with the local government to start including these folks um, who would normally be very difficult to reach um, and starting to um, make the law work for them and have them access supply chains and mm -hmm. encourage formalization. So my point is, uh, we've been knowing a lot about traceability without fancy technology, but now we are using fancy technology. Um, it's not big industry players, it's actually little ones that have been a, a, a voice for reform for many years. Um, and that the, the, the industry is um, changing very quickly. Um, so, um, uh, and, and these are new trends that we should all pay attention to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Haley. you had something. Yeah, hi, I would just like to add, um, you know, I'm, I'm reading some of the comments that are coming in and uh, certainly these are challenges within our industry. And, you know, when I speak as a representative of Freelance Ruby, which is a large, uh, in comparison, large corporate gemstone producer, it's, it's as, you know, as I mentioned, it's easy for us to adhere to these principles and definitely not so easy for some other miners, but it's been fascinating listening to, to Christina. But what I'd like to add is that this, this is a process, um, you know, this is a process as with what's gone on in the diamond industry over the last 30 years, you know, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. But I think it's also very important that we listen to the consumer because, you know, we speak amongst ourselves and, you know, we know which way this is going. And yes, there are, you know, many, many artisanal miners, very, very small operations that, that almost the thought of this is absolutely impossible. But, you know, people like Christina have certainly made the difference and, and, and Daniel with his uh, system at, at Gubelin to, to start to include small artisanal miners into this into this process and in many of the, these far flung places it can be as simple as them having access to uh, the internet via a cell phone and just a simple spreadsheet i know that that is a very simplified version of of what it really entails and involves and it is complicated but it is a process and we have to start somewhere it's what the consumer's looking for after all in the end that's what they want and that's really who we need to listen to. Yeah, thank you. And, and talking about starting somewhere, Danny, I'd like to turn to you because I'd like to discuss now for a little bit how we make it work practically. Um, so for Google and Labs provenance proof, why was it established and what, what is it seeking to achieve? And, and a little bit more about what it is briefly. Well, um, the main motivation was us um, feeling that we are part of a system that is based on intransparency. When I say us, I mean the people in Gen Lab. You know, if we would have a transparent supply chain, uh, there would be much less demand for Gem Lab reports, and we feel that's actually quite a bit of money wasted uh, by for Gem Lab services. And um, we that kind of goes hand in hand what we assume the consumer wants today. So we were starting to um, think about ways to give transparency into the supply chain. You know, we, we never have had the ambition and we do not have the ambition to, to say that we want to bring sustainability or responsibility into the su supply chain because we do not know what that is. We have no understanding and no, no competence or credibility in saying what is ethical or unethical, none of our business. But we have a certain understanding of the industry and of technology. So uh, it started with um, one technology, which is a wonderful innovation from a university in Switzerland. And uh, they have, um, that has triggered the spin-off into a company that has an interesting um, um, tracer, a physical trace, what we are referring to physical anchor, which you can think of something terribly small, invisibly small, which we can put into the rough stone. And then that allows us, and it's kind of like a birth certificate that we kind of make part of the stone. And it survives all the procedures of cutting and cleaning and so on. And later on, you can take it out those who know can take it out, so it's us, uh, read it, and then um, read that uh, birth certificate. And um, that's a great tool for a few select type of gemstones, such as emeralds, 
telling us where the stone is coming from. Uh, the disadvantage is it comes with a cost, so it's not exactly doable for artisanal mining. It's doable for large-scale mining. We have uh, run a pilot in the Sarkiso Emerald Mines in Ethiopia in 2018, and we could show that it's also um, economically viable for small-scale mining uh, cooperatives. You, know, you need to have a certain volume because it adds a cost of, depending on the volume, a few cents to um, a small amount of dollars per gram rough. So it is, it, it has a cost. Then the second uh, uh, development is the, um, the, the blockchain. Which Can is you just explain a little bit clearly, because some people on the chat are asking, what is blockchain? So very briefly, as if you're in an elevator with somebody who needs to learn it before they get to the second floor. <laughs> okay. Think of a blockchain as a logbook for a stone or for a parcel of stone. So if I am the miner, I start this logbook for my specific stone or for a bag of stone or stones. Uh, so I take a picture and uh, I make a description what I think it is. When I'm selling it to you, Ed, I do not only hand over the stone, I also hand over that logbook. Then you are the one and the only one who is entitled to read what has been written in there so far. And you're the only one that is entitled to write the next chapter. So if you are the cutter, then you cut the stone, you enter the new weight on the next page of that digital logbook before you sell it on to, um, to Christina. And then Christina, again, is the only one who is entitled to see the history. You know, I do not see that uh, that logbook has been passed on to Christina, but Christina can see the entire history. And she is, again, the only one who is entitled to write the next chapter, fill the next page, and set, go, um, hand it over to the next owner until it ultimately reaches um, the retailer or the end consumer. So think of it as a logbook with um, permission controlled, permission based visibility into the history of the stone. Okay, well, we that, have yeah, please. That's great. I think we, we probably got up to about the 25th floor there, but it was a nice, concise uh, description of a very complicated thing. Thank you for that, Danny. So we, we know that, you know, Gublin is, is, is using these systems, blockchain and the DNA testing. It's working in limited cases. Um, but it's, it's viable, you've tested it, and it's working, and you have partners. Um, we also, Christina, if I can turn to you with Moyo Gems, you know, you have a system that's working, again, in a specific locality um, with multiple stones, but I'd just like to ask, you know, some people are talking about definitions here. So, so what is ASM, and, and how does it differ from large-scale mining, and why is it relevant to this conversation today? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, ASM is artisanal and small scale mining. Um, so uh, imagine uh, gold panners um, or a few folks um, from a local village um, banding together and digging for gems. Um, so there's 41 million um, artisanal and small scale miners around the world. Um, artisanal mining is the most rudimentary. So it's using a shovel and a pick and human strength to dig minerals out of the ground. Um, large scale mining is um, very large operations typically, um, a lot of geologists and engineers running around uh, 20 to 40 year lifespans or longer. Um, but if you look at labor, 90% um, of all mine labor in the world comes from artisanal and small scale mining. So when you think about it, the mining sector is ASM. Um, they produce about 10% of all minerals um, worldwide, even uranium. <laughs> Uh, can be dug up, which you can imagine that has um, pretty jarring uh, human health consequences in that case. Um, but uh, for this con this conversation for the jewelry sector, you know, about 20% of all gold um, worldwide is mined by these folks hiding behind the trees, or they might be there, but they're not hiding, <laughs> um, and be, might be have legal permits. Um, but um, so when you talk about that, you know, that mining happening over there, it's really important to understand what scale we're talking about, because there's huge differences in human capacity, you know, educational levels, um, and ability to, ma to manage their impacts. Um, so for um, gemstones, between 75 and 90% of all colored gemstones worldwide <laughs> are mined by ASM. And so um, it's really important to have solutions that you know, Danny and, and Gublin have been pioneering um, because if, if you leave them out, you're leaving out millions of people from um, global markets. Um, so that's why, that's why it was so important for us to close the technology gap and work um, with these rural miners and bring blockchain to them 
so they're not left behind. And Christina, listen, we have so much to talk about here, but I'm conscious that we already have 20 questions in the Q&A and we're already 40 minutes past the hour. So briefly, if you can, we'd love to know more about Moyo Gems and how does it address basic due diligence factors um, and inclusiveness specifically? Do the miners sure. actually benefit? And how? Uh, yes, they do benefit. Um, they, um, Moyo comes off the back of a program um, funded by GIA, the Gemological Institute of America. And um, that program increased incomes from um, a half a day education from between three and five times what people were making before. That's half a day of education, and that's three to five times per stone what they're making before by learning how to um, sort, how to enter the value factors. Now, Moyo comes along because um, uh, the women were still selling on a subsistence basis, and they asked for more uh, predictable market opportunities um, and better opportunities. Um, so we have included um, local brokers into that, um, that model so that they win as well. Um, and we've included everyone in a supply chain. Um, so, um, you know, it's not replacing anyone, it's actually including people. Um, so what happens is that the ladies come to the market day that's announced, um, they bring their gems, it's completely voluntary. Um, we have pre-vetted every miner, so we know that she is working on a legal claim with the permission of the, of the license owner, or she might own it herself. Um, they are all, um, they've all received health and safety training uh, in their language, near their village. Um, and they've all committed to achieving um, craft, the craft code over time. And if you go to craftminds.org, um, you, you can see it. Um, we haven't put a timeline on it. Um, I have a um, informal timeline about two years uh, to achieve craft, but we're actually already halfway there. Um, so um, uh, we're um, gonna be showing that as possible too in the ASM context. Um, so we work with local brokers, local miners, um, and all taxes um, and export fees are collected. We use a local exporter who's a master dealer. Um, and uh, we use existing international traders um, who've seen this new trend um, in consumer demand and the jewelers and designers um, who are demanding this product. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, it just shows that we're not trying to replace anyone. We're working within existing systems. Okay, thank you. And, and Craft being the responsible sourcing protocol that's been pioneered by the Alliance for Responsible Mining, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. So we've got systems there that are working there. Thank you, Christina, with Moyo Gems. Um, I, I'd like to hear more, Haley, from you about your system with Greenland Ruby. So briefly, if you can, explain the process that, by which each gem is tracked and traced for you guys. Uh, thanks, Ed, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to, to speak on this uh, track and tracing on our internal system. Uh, and like I said, uh, and as many people will have pointed out in their comments, for a company like Greenland Ruby, this is a, a, pretty, a pretty standard procedure, I should say. This was something that was set up right from the very, very beginning. It was just a ways and means of us keeping control of our inventory. And because as a company, we cut and polish all of our own gems with our partner facilities, we really are able to keep control of, of, our, of our gems directly from the mine into the marketplace, literally into the hands of our, of our customers, you know, on every tier of the industry, you know, whether that's a jewelry manufacturer or a designer or a dealer, um, you know, we're able to track that journey. Um, through a process of our, of our inventory control. Um, and I just want to show you like a little show and tell. Um, the company developed um, what we call our certificate of origin. This is not a third party laboratory report, but it's more of a birth certificate. And it actually, um, we, we produce this with every, with every, we're capable of producing it with every single gemstone that comes out of the mine in Apolutok, as you so nicely put pronounce the, the name, Ed. But uh, each and every gem uh, comes with a certificate of origin. You can imagine the logistics behind something like this. So we actually um, really you know, promote this with gems over one carat. But um, each gem has its identity number, which is documented on the certificate, and the details of the gem sit right there. The certificate is endorsed by the government of Greenland, which is also 
uh, you know, part of our third party authentication of the journey of our stones. So this is really the way we actually explain our process um, and everything is sort of documented in this little uh, certificate of origin, which is um, not only a powerful tool when it comes to the salesperson, but it's also something that we feel the consumer finds extremely, uh, extremely, extremely valuable. So that Great. is our system. Great. Thank you. I remember seeing a prototype of that document in a bar in Bogota, but that's another oh. story for another time. Um, yeah, you were privy to the first, um, the first draft, but um, yes, yeah, so we've come a long way in refining that document. And um, as you can imagine, you know, logistically, it's difficult to, to sometimes manage, but it is extremely valuable in terms of understanding mind to market. Yeah, thank you. So, Clement, if I can turn to you, you know, we, we've got some systems that are working here. OK, we're talking about limited um, species or limited locations. But from your perspective and from ICA's perspective, what's the most workable system to satisfy traceability demands? OK, first of all, I would like to go back to the previous questions that uh, Daniel and Christina uh, mentioned about some projects that uh, permits the full traceability uh, even in uh, am an amethyst mine and other examples there. We also believe it is possible, but that is only possible with formalization. You see, if the mine is formalized, if the miners are formalized, that will be possible. That will bring a whole other subject, you see, which is extremely difficult to do that all around the world. Now, Back to the, your question, Ed. Since its very beginning, ICA has required its members to adhere to a code of ethics, to their code of ethics. So today, consumers are increasingly interested in products that are ethically and responsibly, which led to ICA to evolve and create and easy the concerns of the customers for responsible sourcing. We created the accredited ethical member status the accredited ethical member, he undertakes an annual refresher and update on CIGO Responsible Sourcing Guide on the ICA Code of Ethics and Duties of Disclosures, which all are basically the OECD guidelines. And they commit, they will take responsibility for ensuring these policies and to adhere and drive, drive down to their organizations. You see, that's a, a nice, uh, this is, what ICA is working at the moment. Mm. And you, you talked about formalization, Clement, which is a really important point. Yes. Can you give any examples of areas where formalization is, is working from your perspective? Well, I can give examples here in Brazil, uh, about two mines here in Brazil. Which, uh, the miners, they created cooperatives. Uh, once it's in an emerald mine in Nova Era, and the other one is in the south of Bahia, the Grutilated Ports Mine. They created cooperatives and all the Garimperos, the miners, they uh, belong to the, those cooperatives and those cooperatives, cooperatives, they issue the, the, the notes and that permits uh, traceability all, all way along as well, you see? And besides uh, uh, the notes that they give when they sell, uh, they provide uh, Legal, uh, legal orientations and uh, environmental also orientations. So those two models worked uh, well in, here in Brazil. Cooperatives of miners. Okay, great, thank you. So we've talked about you know, whether it works practically and we've analyzed some of the systems that are, that are out there which are working. And, but you know, we really wanna make it work for all as well. Um, so, Christina, if I can turn back to you, you what, what key sustainability and human rights issues are we, are we going to solve and what do we need to really think about so that everybody progresses? Yeah, sure. Um, great question. And um, let's be clear that, that there's um, different human rights and legal challenges um, at all scales of mining. <laughs> um, so just because um, it comes from a larger scale mine, um, doesn't mean it's um, necessarily responsible. Um, you know, Greenland Ruby is um, an excellent um, uh, case of, of, um, of great practice. Um, but um, I wish all um, larger scale companies were like that. Um, and it's not always the case, so let's be clear about that. Um, with our, within artisanal and small scale mining, um, we tend to see 
um, serious uh, occupational health and safety challenges. So tunnel collapses, um, sudden flooding, um, something called silicosis, which if you're mining underground, um, it, it can be horrific to your body. So you have silica dust scarring your lungs, affecting your immune system and dis disabling you um, in five years um, or so. It's an, it's an invisible disease. Um, so you have um, some of these very basic things that can be addressed by wearing a mask, for example, um, can be ad addressed by engaging. Um, you also have some environmental challenges typically when you have surface mining happening. Um, and you also can have conflict, um, whether it's supporting an armed group, um, whether those, um, you know, armed group is controlling that site, um, or whether um, that group is, you know, preying on a mine site. Um, so this is all, these are all reasons to, to understand where, where your gems are coming from, what are you contributing to directly, and how are you helping change that area um, proactively and positively over time. And if you're not being proactive, you are not changing the situation. Um, and if you don't know where your gems are coming from, <laughs> you are part of a status quo. Um, so there are small things to start understanding from your suppliers where it's coming from. Is it Chile or is it Afghanistan? What are those? What are the issues in those areas? Um, and um, start thinking about the small and big steps you can start doing. Um, you know, within Gemstones, you can support pilot initiatives like Moyo, um, buy a few, see if they sell. Um, within um, other materials, you can start buying Fairmind gold, for example, um, or other um, ways that you are making a difference um, and being really intentional about that. Thank you. Clement, um, Maria in the chat has asked, in the spirit of transparency, if you can give the names of those mines or the Brazilian mines that you were just talking about that have gone through formalization process. Yeah, we have uh, even Brian here who, who, who did Brian a lot Brian Cook of, is with us, yes. Brian Cook is with us, yes. And uh, it's uh, the rutilated quartz mine. And, and uh, I, the one is in Nova Era. What, the emerald mine is in Nova Era. Nova Era is close to Itabira, close to Belmont Mine, about 10 kilometers from Belmont Mine. Great, thank you. Uh, Clement, let's, let's stay with you a little bit in terms of you know, making this work for all. I mean, we, we know that traceability, one of the effects is it shortens the supply chain, the, this wonderful world, disintermediation, which basically means cutting out the middleman. So how does that affect the role of traders and many of your members at ICA? Uh, you mean uh, if, okay. if 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 the if the traceability systems which are coming in, if that shortens yeah. the supply chain, how mm -hmm. is that going to affect many of the gemstone traders around the world? Okay, we we always uh, uh, we recently we have been at adv advising our members to attend the AEM status and follow the OECD guidelines, and uh, we we additionally. Uh, Wait a minute here. Aki, I missed here on my notes here. Okay. So, uh, and we constantly evaluate how to align our codes of ethics with new regulations, with best practice, due diligence tools. So the challenge is to, again, is to reach and formalize the small miners and dealers and taking the diverse cultural back backgrounds into account while formalizing the sector without negatively impacting their lives. So ICA has recently established also a fund called Gems Keep Giving. Mm -hmm. Through this fund, we'll be actively looking to help improve livelihoods of many small artisanal miners, and uh, which are, they are very important partners in our industry. And yet they live, most of them live in very, uh, lower conditions you see so with this uh, with this found we will focus on possibly assistance with safety procedures methods training education social fare and protection of their environment so i take this opportunity here to thank uh, jck who recently made a $25,000 donation for this found uh, thank you that's great to highlight that thanks clement danny you wanted to say something yeah, I mean, to uh, come back to your question of if and how the, um, the transparency 
transparency, giving transparency into the supply chain might shorten the supply chain, actually. Honestly, I believe this is um, unavoidable to some extent, but I think it's also no reason that uh, now the, all these dealers or all the middlemen have to, um, to panic because I'm convinced that the only thing that changes is that you have to demonstrate what value you're adding to the stone. So it's not as such as no dealers are needed in between. Um, they do quite an important job, in fact. But you, you're going to have to kind of explain wh what you are doing. You know, this can be some paperwork. This can be some export documentation. This can do, be, um, 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 you know, collecting stones and uh, grading them and putting them together in a layout. So there are many of, of uh, value-added services that the trade is doing. But if you are not able to demonstrate what you're doing, then you're going to be, going to be considered obsolete and then you're rightfully out of the equation because then you're just inflating the price and that's not fair for the end consumer and that's not fair for the people for earlier in the supply chain that might take higher risk but not get properly rewarded for the risk they take. Christina. Sure. Um, you know, there's a, a range of folks um, to work with um, you know, that, that designers and jewelers can work with. Um, and there are easy steps that every single trader can take um, to start recognizing this new world we're in. Um, so it's about incorporating, about working with your current supply chain, about working with your current suppliers and asking them um, for some basic information and about how they are responding. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if all of us could tell a beautiful story about the source, about what you're doing specifically to improve people's lives every day? So I think it's, 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 um, it's not about shorting the supply chain, it's about being inclusive um, in your change about asking questions. A friend of mine loves saying, be a PETA, be a pain in the ass <laughs> um, with your suppliers and ask for what they're doing and start asking for evidence. Um, and the beautiful thing about smartphones these days is that they each have, have geotags, um, all the pictures. So if they're sending you pictures from Brazil um, and they should be sourcing from somewhere else, um, that's a problem. And that's, that, the evidence does not support the claim. Um, so it's it's one thing to talk about. Um, uh, so it's one thing to talk about change. The other thing to, is to actually demonstrate it and have evidence. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, you know it's a new day, and um, there are folks who see the change in the industry, um, and there are easy ways for everyone to be part of that change. Yeah, Clement, yes. Yeah. So the companies that outlive this crisis are those that are able to adapt to those changes. And uh, the traders, uh, like Daniel said, who cannot provide a service and add value from the producer or to their clients uh, will be out of the, 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 will disappear, I believe. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I must say, you know, we kind of expected that this would be an interesting discussion, but I tell you, the chat box has absolutely exploded with comments. Um, so we, and we're really, and thank you for everybody there. There's stunning examples of, of sharing of ideas and, and information here. So what we will do at the end when we finish, we'll, we won't end the session and people can stay on and read the chat box at their own time and their own leisure. Um, and as, as we know, this session is recorded and should be up on the Sujo website by the weekend. But we do want to think about consumer demand. You know, all of this is being driven by consumer demand as well as altruism and people doing wanting to do the right thing, if I can put it that simply. Um, but um, wh why don't we turn to Haley? You know, for, from your perspective at Greenland Ruby, how does being a responsible source as a marketeer, how does it influence you, influence your messaging? And how's it accepted by your customers? Uh, thanks, Ed. And I realize that we're short of time, so I'm going to try to make it quick. And um, yeah, this has been such an interesting conversation. And I realize, um, you know, more and more just how easy, it, how easy it is for a company like Greenland Ruby to comply to all of these, uh, these regulations and responsible sourcing and tracking and tracing. And of course, being responsible, which is also a big word, you know, what does that encompass? Um, and, and what do we do with that? And how do we explain that through our messaging? Um, and, and obviously, this is one of our pillars of our company is 
is the fact that we are a new and responsible source of colored gemstones. Not only that uh, the gem is mined in, in a very um, unique and pristine environment, um, I might add, um, in the bottom of a lake that has been dredged and once the deposit has been mined out, which is approximately you know, 20 to 30 years from now, the water will be returned back into the lake and left as pristine as it was before the company actually touched it. Um, but for us, this idea of responsibility is really a two-pronged approach. Of course, we want to tell this message to the end consumer or to our customers who we feel are our most important. Um, and our customers are starting, the, the end consumer is starting to expect this uh, this kind of responsible behavior. Um, and certainly we're seeing that with our customers, um, but we still have to explain it. But not only do we use the, I don't wanna use it as marketing per se, but it is one of our marketing messages, but simply that it is the, the right thing to do, actually. You know, this is, you know, this, this is just simply the way the industry is moving forward. But, you know, what, what and, and sometimes, you know, people ask, you know, what is the cost of responsibility? And, you know, my answer to that is, well, what is the cost of not being responsible? Yeah. You know, um, do we have a choice? And, and I do believe that moving forward, this is just going to be just going to be the norm. I mean, we see it in other industries. I saw some comments from Pat in the chat room, Pat Sivrud. You know, it's, we, we see it in the food industry. We see already people paying, you know, we do it already for organic organically sourced um, of, of foodstuffs and, and, and apparel industry is doing, doing the same thing. But, you know, for us, it's in our DNA. It's, it's doing well by doing right. And we feel like ultimately this is going to be, um, you know, the way our industry is moving. Danny, I want to bring you into the conversation, but I, I, you're, you're probably engaged in the chat room there, which is, which is understandably. So many uh, comments coming backwards and forwards, it's hard to keep track. And, uh, you, you know, I was just thinking if we were actually in a seminar at a trade show, it'd be like everybody's yeah. being really rude and talking while the panelists are talking. All at the same time, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, we, 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 it's great to be part of this because it, you know, it's an active discussion. That's the important point. But Danny, do you, hours. do you see gemstones offered will full traceability to be the norm going forward or, or do you think they'll continue to be a bit of a niche product where they are at the moment well um, there are it's not as such or it would be naive to assume that everybody out there that is buying a piece of jewelry wants to know the entire story of that stone or of that piece that's not going to happen but when we are busy in the process, we are all stakeholders in the supply chain at the mining site, cutting, testing, trading, jewelry. We do not know what the ultimate consumer might want to have. So we better are prepared and collect the information and track the information uh, of the, along the supply chain um, uh, that we can contribute to and we make sure that it gets forwarded. And keep in mind, it's not only about the end consumer. Of course, the end consumer is the one that is fueling this ent entire industry but there are other stakeholders we have um regulators you know they are putting increasing pressure on us to come up with this transparency we have banks we have insurances they are increasingly reluctant to keep um financing this industry and to keep insuring this industry that's a big problem think of the indian uh, diamond industry you know they are suffering a lot from kind of not being capable to actually um have credible to critically gauge the, the, the actual value of their goods. So um, to embrace these technologies is actually the, the, the step, the one step that you need to do to have an easy, you know, a easy way to give this transparency that not only end consumers might want, but that regulators, banks, insurances definitely expect to have. Otherwise, you're going to struggle. Thank you. We're Clement, I'd like I'd like to hear from you as well for, from from the ICA perspective. What, how do you view the coloured gemstone market right now, and how is ICA planning to support the market as it recovers as well? Yeah, our product is a discretionary luxury purchase, which is always among the first one to be affected and the last one to recover. Uh, mining, cutting, manufacturing, and trading has virtually stopped. Trading is almost impossible because of the border closed. And uh, the trade shows has been postponed and, and canceled. 
So the consumers of our products in the gem business are mostly under stress. Communication, trust have always been a cornerstone of our industry. So it will be these attributes that will help the industry to recover and come back, you see, and bounce back, as it had done through centuries. So ICA has never been busier supporting members, the industry, in communicating and promoting collagen stones. One of these initiatives uh, right now, it's a trading and informational platform initial, initially to be developed in uh, Asia. Uh, in countries like uh, India, Thailand, Indonesia, and China. And China, we believe China to be the biggest growth potential for consumption of gemstones in the near future. So we have been developing some very strong par partnerships uh, and projects, like uh, uh, many projects. One of them is the ICA Congress in September 2021, which is going to be uh, strictly directed to business. It will be about the integration of the international market with the Chinese market. So lastly, ICA continues to link members and stakeholders with mind to market and address issues related to the industry through our publications in color, our newsletters. So that's, and we've been working hard, I mean, uh, in our committees lately. We never worked so hard. We are having like once a week meetings with the committee. Before we used to have like twice a year. So we've been working and developing projects and working better, see what we can do best for, for the, our members and the industry. Okay, obrigado for that, Clement. And uh, Christina, just before we can get to some questions, and we do apologize that we've run over, but I think everybody would agree this conversation has been riveting, as has the chat. Christina, you wanted to make a last point. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of make traceability a little less scary. Um, you know, um, with Moyo, we do not put everything that we know about the miners on the supply chain. We do not put their locations on the supply chain, on the blockchain. Um, but we know that, we keep that off the chain. Um, and we do that for privacy reasons. Um, and um, my point being is that you have control about what you put on the blockchain um, and what evidence points you put on there um, and the description of the mine site and things like that. You're not giving away all your secrets. Um, you're, telling about, you're talking about what you know about the site, who you know is on the site and what due diligence you might have done on that site. Um, you're giving yourself credit um, for knowing that place um, and then progressively over time, um, improving the conditions on that place. Um, so um, if anyone wants to understand how to apply blockchain or tr basic traceability systems in different places, let me know. I'm happy to talk to ICA members as well, um, or CIVJO members. Um, it's not a scary thing. It's actually, it can be a beautiful thing. Um, and, you know, talking about the reopening, um, those, um, you know, those vendors who can service their consumer well will be the ones that survive. And if people are not um, working on these kind of questions, um, they're obsolete already, um, but it's not too late. You can, um, you can learn what to do now, and I'm happy to engage in those discussions. Okay, thank you. Let's take some time to go through the questions in the, in the Q&A, and uh, Steve, maybe you can pick out some, but there's one here that attracted my attention if I can get started, which is from Dario Marchiori. He asks, what is the weakest part of the traceability process? Danny is the scientist. Can I ask you, what is the weakest part of the traceability process? Well, I'm not exactly sure to which part of traceability process um, Dario is uh, pointing, you know, from a from the technology point of view, I would like to make a comment about the, um, the blockchain. So um, the blockchain is a wonderful tool. I think it's, gonna, it's, it's here to stay in all aspects of our life. Um, but we have to be aware that the blockchain does not have any systems in place. And us as the one providing the blockchain with our uh, um, technology partner Everledger, and they're doing a wonderful job as well. You know, we do not make any attempt 
to check the veracity of the information that people put in the blockchain. That's usually something that people say as an excuse somehow not to use the blockchain. They say, okay, you know, I can take a, a black, a black uh, stone and call it a pigeon blood red ruby. Correct, you can do that. The technology won't stop you from doing that. But because I know that there is a certain type of visibility and the people downstream the supply chain might see that this Daniel guy in Switzerland is calling Blackstone's pitch and blood ruby, that will probably stop me from doing that because it becomes uh, over time uh, a pattern that p the industry will know that the bullshit comes from this Daniel guy in Switzerland. You know? So <laughs> I think although there is no technical barrier to write wrong information into the blockchain, in itself, it will already um, over time take out um, quite a bit of the bullshit which I think is a good thing. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but you might have to explain better if it's something else, sorry. No, you answered it from an angle that I thought was relevant. So that's great, thank you. Now, th th there's another question here, sorry. I, I, I learned long ago that in any gemstone deal, everybody's got to bring something to the table. And Christina Miller, a previous show guest of ours, has asked a great question. Can you address the process of building trust with the miners and the mining communities to get, in, to get involved in traceability? And what have the communities brought to the table? Christina, can you, ask the, can you answer Christina's question? Yes, um, in our case, um, of course, Moyo was designed um, with the women miners themselves. Um, we, at, we came to them and we said, hey, we have this idea. Um, what do you think of it? Um, if, if you like it, that's great. Let's talk about it. Um, and let's, and that's designed together. If not, don't worry, you still get lunch. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, we, we were intentional about co-designing based on an environment. Um, we also were intentional about having local partners. So PACT has a Tanzania office. Um, our program is now entirely run by that Tanzania office. Um, we also work with the Tanzania Women Miners Association. Um, they are a group that's been around for a long time. They have 3,000 members across Tanzania. Um, and, you know, at this time, you know, with supply chains being frozen, um, we've been able to rely on our local partners to keep buying going. So we've been able to develop a remote buying model <coughs> that elevates our local partners. Um, our local partners also tell us um, what we're doing wrong and perceptions. Um, and, um, you know, the, the Tuoma, our partner, um, has ha had some difficult conversation with us sometimes. And that's why I wanted to work with them because I met them 10 years ago and they schooled me on gender. And I was so impressed. That's why I wanted to work with them. Um, and um, so that's, so the answer to Christina's question is you must design anything you do with the community. Mm -hmm with the government officials that um, you should be your partners in this, and they can be your partners, I can talk about that. Um, and you must have local organizations as a part of the process. Um, it'll bring down costs, <laughs> um, and um, it'll also make your program more responsive. Okay, thanks. Steve, over to you. Uh, yeah, I just want to actually get a question that was um, sent in by Charles Abouchard, who uh, incidentally is also president of the Sibjo Coloured Stone Commission. Um, Charles actually asked two questions, but I'm actually going to look at the second one and, and maybe direct it first at Clement, because I think it's, a, it's an important uh, um, uh, point over here. He says nobody in the group speaks about the thousands of stones which are already in the market. Um, it's something I've also heard of people, you know, companies that have been sitting on large stocks of gemstones sometimes for generations. Um, and, and ask essentially what can be done in these cases over here where you if we be demanding traceability and people have large amounts of stocks that essentially going to have to be grandfathered into the system. Um, okay. Clement, please. Okay. That's uh, just one more example of the difficult for traceability. You see, like I mentioned, many other difficulties. And uh, I, I really don't know what can be done uh, with that to be traceable to to the origin, unless uh, a lab, Daniel may uh, clear, he wants to talk about it. Maybe a lab can uh, trace the origin of it just uh, by stating it. Danny, you wanted to come in. Yes. Um, you all know Dudley Blauet, uh, gemstone dealer, wholesaler from the US. 
Dudley is traveling the world since decades. You know, in total, he has spent like seven years in Pakistan alone. He is traveling other places, and he has a stock of, I believe, something like one hundred thousand plus stones. So um, we have started to discuss with him um, some uh, one two years ago, and he decided he was said he wants to put those stones on the blockchain. So he is not the miner. He's not even the, he's not the cutter. He is just somewhere in the midstream of the supply chain. And he says he wants to kind of start that he can be held accountable for what he does. Wonderful. So he kind of, he has his little booklet that he has, or his little booklets, I think there are many of them, where he has made his handwritten notes from whom has he bought the stone, in which place, at which date. So what he's doing now is he is entering all those stones or those lots and parcels of stones into the blockchain and he's um, typing this information into the blockchain. So there's no actual blockchain type of proof where it's coming from, but as of now, he can continue this digital ledger and um, he has by his uh, reputation and by his um, credibility he has in the trade, he has um, actually just entered the story that he knows already into that blockchain and from now on it can be continued in the, in the way that uh, today's technology allows. So it's a wonderful example of um, that at every stage, you know, even if you're an auction house, you can start doing that so that then you can be held accountable for what you do and start beginning that story in this, in this uh, new type of form. It's, excuse me here. This is possible because uh, he has a booklet with all the information about all the stones. And the other way to, to do that, answering Charles also, is uh, knowing your supplier and knowing who your client is also. And uh, the trust, you see, uh, for people who don't have, uh, uh, have an old stock, admit they don't have this information, that's the only way to do it. I think that's an important point, Clement. And when sometimes people mention KYC to gemstone traders, they don't understand the term, but actually they've been doing it for generations. It's about trust up to the customer and trust from the supplier. But how do we formalize that in the 21st century where the consumer is demanding slightly more than things that are written between generations? Um, we, we, we do have an interesting series of questions here that really relate to the added value that comes from traceability programs. And Haley, I'd like to put this to you because you've developed a system there in Greenland. But I mean, Nora, Nora Linsingen, asks, should gemstones with traceability and transparency in supply chain increase in value? Who should bear the cost of these systems? The consumer or the producer or the person mining the goods themselves? Well, thanks for the question, Ed, and I touched on it a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier, um, saying that as, as consumers, you know, we are already paying a little extra for sustainably sourced goods you know, whether these are groceries or, or apparel. But, um, you know, that's a very, very good question indeed. And and who is paying more for, for these processes? It is indeed expensive to start running and operating uh, systems such as these. Um, you know, this is a very, very personal question and a personal answer indeed. But um, I think that this, in time, will be built into the cost of the gemstone. It will be simply a matter of the, the cost of these materials, uh, the, the, the cost of this, these programs, and this will relate right back to the, to, to the source. And, 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 and the, you know, there will be a little bit added at every step of the supply chain, let's say. And, and does the consumer pay extra for that? Well, you, Perhaps so, but you know that's going to ensure responsibility right at the very, very sources, as what Christine uh, has been saying, and the transparency will uh, guarantee that these are the people that are going to be benefiting in the case of small scale and artisanal mining. Okay, thank you, Christina. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, as far as who pays, you know, we we back up into the the gem guide. Um, and we have learned that you cannot charge more um, than um, you know that 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 price that um, that in the guidelines. Um, I, I also want to say that you know we're we're adding value to these gems by the rich storytelling that we can provide. 
by that assurance that you know that that we've done the due diligence, um, and we we can tell you again the miner's name who mined that gem. Um, no one else can do that. So um, I just want to make it clear that um, it's value add um, at the source by by doing this, um, and also that it costs money to formalize. Um, so if your supply chain is entirely illegal <laughs> until it is imported into, you know, your your country, um, that's a problem. Um, and it costs money to start to make those shifts. Um, and formalization um, of your supply chain is a process. So it's, you don't have to be perfect right away and no one expects you to. Um, but if, if you're not making these small steps, um, that's a problem. Um, and it means that you're putting yourself at risk, um, reputational damage. You know, we've all seen that Guardian article about Madagascar. Um, and um, you know, this, this is what people, people will be expecting um, in the near future. So um, yes, who pays? The stones will be slightly more expensive because of that work that's been done at the source, but also you're getting a beautiful story um, if you're doing things right. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Clement, there's a question here from Damien Cody, so I, I feel it would be appropriate to, to I mean, yeah. put that one to you. Hi Damien, thanks for joining us. But da Damien asks, gems from many sources can be treated, cut, and sorted into parcels by size, color, and quality. So how can the traceability carry through with each stone in this example, the example where different colors and sizes and types of stones are all sorted together to satisfy the customer's need? We have a good example here, which is uh, Thailand, uh, Chantaburi. Chantaburi receives like parcels from small parcels to containers of stones. And these stones are distributed to eating specialists, cutting, and traders. And uh, they, they got mixed along, you know, with the grading and all that. And uh, this makes it very difficult to be traced uh, afterwards, you see? Thank you. We've absolutely blown our one hour time limit out of the water, haven't we, ladies and gents? But Danny, Danny's still keen to go, so join in, Jan, Danny. Um, Clement, the blockchain, at least the, the, what the Everledger people have uh, uh, done for our province group blockchain, it can perfectly handle this splitting of parcels into sub parcels, taking one single stone out and um, merging different parcels into a new parcel and so on. There's no, it's just two, three clicks and then it's done. So that is not a problem at all. It can deal with that, you know, that's, that's a reality. Then it gets applied. We have meanwhile like 200 something companies that have done the entire subscription that are using this blockchain. Um, so it is, it is doable, you know, it's not a big um, uh, work to do that. It's free of charge. So the technology is out there. You just have to go and use it. I agree that that can be doable, uh, but what if uh, uh, I export uh, to Bangkok, a stone that was mined in Africa, not me, not myself, and without the trace where it was produced, you see, uh, uh, when it was bought from a dealer, uh, that they bought from a, a, a broker and a producer, so that gets lost, you see, in the, even in the blockchain. But I think it can work. Blockchain might work in, in some cases, but not all. That's my opinion. Um, Clement, it even works in this case. You can then enter the stone or the parcel in the blockchain and say, I bought it on the street from a guy, I do not know his, names, his name. Fair enough, you know, at least you kind of, you, you start to, to, um, to, be, um, to be accountable for what you do. And if you're honest and say, I do not know where I bought it from, fair enough. You know, some people might then shy off and other people might say, no, I appreciate he is honest, the guy. You buy it from there. But that is fine. That is fine. I mean, you just don't know where it came from. I mean, the traceability you want, which mine it came from, you won't know. But this is what I just mentioned. Know your supplier. Trust your supplier, you see? And uh, then you go for it. I think it's a good point, Danny, as well. You know, small steps is what people need to think about if they're stepping into the new world. And Christina, we've talked about that as well. And you've been finding that that's the most important message to people who, who are bamboozled, if I can use that word, about how to get started. That's right. Um, no one achieves perfection 
immediately. Um, uh, if you if you and if you demand if you set if you set the, the standard too high, no one can achieve it. <laughs> so let's um, all agree on a, a base standard. Um, there's craft can be really useful. I can share. Can you spell, can you spell out craft for people listening? Yeah, it's the uh, code for risk mitigation um, in artisanal mining and trade. Um, so if you go to craftminds.org, I can put it in the, the chat. Thank you. Craftminds.org. Um, it, I was part of the committee that um, that helped create it. Um, it was tested with artisanal miners um, in, in Latin America and Africa with their um, feedback. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's a place to start and it tracks the OECD due diligence guidelines, which is an international norm um, on you know, not sponsoring conflict, not having child labor on your mind, um, not contributing to corruption, things like that. Um, and it also expects progressive improvement over time. So it does not expect the world. It's a place to start. And this gives me an opportunity to give you my favorite quote of the day, which Nivea has reminded me in the chat, that perfection is so 2019. And we're now in 2020, and it's okay to be honest and transparent and real in this world we're in now. Listen, I know that we could talk about this possibly for another hour. And I really do appreciate that there's still almost 180 people on the line, but you guys are all very busy. We've taken a lot of your time and we really appreciate what a fantastic discussion we've had here today. Thank you to everybody. Can I ask you, it would be nice if we just have a very brief closing remarks from each of you. And when I do mean very brief, I mean from, from ground floor to first floor in the elevator. Why don't we start with you, Haley, if we can. Thank you so much. And I'll be very, very quick. This was an extremely interesting conversation. And like I said in the very beginning, it's testament to just how important this information is, how relevant it is, where our industry is actually going. There's no stopping it. So we all need to jump on this bandwagon and uh, support one another. I believe from the very, very large companies right to the individual small scale miners, it's support. There's enough for everybody out there. It's just a matter of making it happen because that's what our consumer wants. That's what they're looking for. And we want to work with um, the manufacturers and designers and, and dealers and, and, and um, the large companies to get gems into the hands of the consumers with the messages that they want to hear responsibly and uh, transparently. Thanks Thank you. Me. Thank you. Clement, if we can turn to you for your elevator ending pitch. I would like to, to thank you. No, it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, what I suggest is uh, that we all, all work for a simple approach, you see, which is feasible for all, all everyone in the supply chain. And uh, we'll be willing, as I mentioned, all the time to sit with all the important stakeholders and uh, take the right decisions for the benefit of our industry. Thanks, Clement. Christina. Um, with the right people in the room, anything is possible. Um, so um, if you are looking for where to start to understand your supply chain, I can tell you who to talk to. <laughs> um, if you are sourcing um, in um, far-flung places, I can tell you who to talk to. Um, I think we've been able to achieve some really um, amazing things the last few years because new people are entering the space and the right people are coming together. Um, so start somewhere, start understanding where your stones are coming from. Um, that's the very first step. It's not the end, it's the very first step. Um, and then you can um, help change the world. So thank you. Thank you. With the right people in the room, anything is possible. It's great, great thought. Um, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, uh, we all know it with this Corona bug that is going around. That makes definitely understand everybody that we are in a period of change, you know. I mean, the change already started in our industry years before, but now it becomes so obvious. I think what everybody has to do is to rethink his or her business model and think about how we want to, uh, how you want to position yourself and then um, uh, embrace the respective uh, method uh, technologies or narratives uh, that you think you can um, exist and survive and uh, be successful to what your clientele is. Uh, your direct client in the industry or to the end consumer. And then uh, everything else come natural. You know, technology are, are around, you can use them. Um, so it's, it's no, the outlook is not that grim, I would say. It's quite, quite 
optimistic, a real quite optimistic. Lovely words from a Swiss gentleman. The outlook is not that grim. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's finish up now here. Next week, we're having a slightly different Jewelry Industry Voices. We'll be having a round table discussion. Again, we'll be tackling the topic of technology and the transformation, but we'll be focusing on China. We're very pleased to say that Ashley Dudaranok, who many of you may know from LinkedIn and Instagram, and a very well-known China digital marketeer, will be joining for a discussion between Stefan Fischler and also Thomas Bayer, two uh, previous guests on these Jewelry Industry Voices webinars. So please, the invitations for that will be going out tomorrow on the mailing list. And also tomorrow, if I can highlight the, uh, the next uh, Sibjo sponsored uh, 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 home gemology webinar from our friend Rui Gallopin, which will be on organic or biogenic gems. If I can just take a minute to wish Rui a happy birthday. It's Rui's birthday today. So we wish Rui a very happy birthday and we thank him all for the work that he's been doing to educate us and entertain us and connect us since middle of March through these difficult times. Happy birthday, buddy. You're a rock star. And so lastly, if you'd like to get the invitations for Rui's Home Gemology and also these Jewelry Industry Voices webinars, please sign up to Sibjo Communications. You can check us out on social media as well. And I try to do a wrap up email that goes out from Zoom. So this old dinosaur is gonna to have to learn a new trick and somehow download this chat box and include all of that discussion in that email that goes out because there's some really great information in there. Gaetano, would you like to take us to the end, please? Thank you very much, uh, Ed. And thank you very much to all the panelists uh, each one of you has been truly superb. I am uh, impressed. I don't think that I will make uh, extra comments. I took uh, sometimes, you probably noticed that I switch off the camera because I want to read uh, uh, all the uh, questions in the chat and the question and answer. And honestly, it has been a very sparkling session. Thank you all and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks Gaetano. Thanks to Steve as well for everything that you're doing for these. Um, thank you to the panelists for your time and but most importantly thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and joining our community every week. It is much appreciated and we hope we're adding some kind of value to your days. What I'm going to do is I won't end the meeting for all now. I think what we'll do is just mute our microphones and turn off our videos. And that means if any of you out there want to stay for 10, 15 minutes and read through the chat, um, please feel free to do so. And if any of the panelists feel so inclined to stay, and if you want to answer any of the questions, please feel free to do so. Thanks, everybody. Signing off from London until next week. Take care, be safe, and I wish you all good business for those of you that have returned. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, thanks. <laughs>